choose the genetics you want to breed from? How do you choose the stock that you want to have? So let's, let's talk about some concepts of breeding. Um, I, I think it's pretty easy to point out how, how poorly selective breeding works, but uh, there are people who love to point to what they think are wonderful examples of how well it works. Um, I don't know how many of you... Uh, we just had chicken for supper tonight, and if you've noticed the chicken there and the chicken at Kentucky Fried Chicken and the chicken at um, Popeyes, and the chicken you buy in the normal grocery store is not even chicken. You have a whole generation of people today don't even know what chicken tastes like because none of those tasted like chicken. It's sort of like some kind of weird flab that isn't fat, but it's not meat. It's called quish. It's called quish. Squish. Squish. Yeah, they squish it together. Oh, I don't. But, no. But what it is is basically they they came up came up with this genetic combination of a Cornish and a rock, and they cross a Cornish with a rock, and they end up with this this chicken that does nothing but stand there and eat until it can't stand on its own legs anymore, and it makes it from a chick to big enough to eat in like half the time that it used to take. It's not fit to eat. But it makes it to big enough to eat in half the time. Anyway, to me, this is not a success story. This is a failure story. Um, because you basically created a chicken that's not sustainable. This chicken cannot even survive. It can't even stand up on its own legs because it is so fat and it has grown so fast. Well, that's really what you get when you start doing a lot of intensive selective breeding. So, but that's the kind of stuff they'll point to and say, well, look how much better this is now because we can get this chicken to market in this amount of time. Um, okay, whatever. If you think that's a success story, go for it. But what I see is they take a, they take a breed like, um, like Clydesdales, for instance, which is an awesome workhorse, and they breed them to have really lots of feathers on their feet, and they breed them to really pick up their feet really nicely, and they breed them for a whole bunch of traits, none of which make them good workhorses and none of which they used to breed for. They used to just happen to be that way, but then they decided to exaggerate those traits so that, they, so that they'd be a bigger, a better show horse, right? And what they did was they destroyed a perfectly good breed. We now have Clydesdales that have really soft hooves. They have all kinds of hoof problems. They have all kinds of health problems. They have all kinds of problems that they didn't have until we started focusing on, on these specific little traits. Um, so I, I talked to a lady who was a horse breeder once, and she said, it's funny, people are always breeding horses for all these superficial things. And what they ought to be breeding them for is, she had her golden, I don't remember how many traits it was, but one of them was longevity. One of them was trainability and willingness. One of them was uh, um, just good health, just good all-around health, not just longevity, because it doesn't matter how long they live. If they're, if they're miserable the whole time and they're not really healthy, then they're not of much use. So... The, the real things you should be breeding for are almost never what they're breeding for. Um, so in the case of bees, here's what we have. We have, uh, we have the Minnesota Hygienics, and they're breeding them just for hygienic behavior. 
And then we have the verosensitive hygiene, which is just hyper uh, hygienic behavior. In fact, I'm hearing from beekeepers who have VSHBs where in the middle of summer, all of a sudden, they're just hauling all the brood out the door. All of it. Just clean out the whole brood nest, all out, out, the, out the door. Well, what you've done is you've bred an OCD bee. So how is that a good thing? So, so my point is, it's a really dangerous thing to pick really specific traits and then breed for just these little specific traits. What you need to do is look at the big picture. You need to look at the big picture, not the little finite, the little... In other words, typically the scientists are looking at the mitochondria in the cells and the leaves on the trees, and what they need to be looking at is the forest. And they don't want to look at the forest, they want to look at the mitochondria in the cell. Well, the mitochondria in the cell doesn't help you understand the health of the forest. It brings me back to the, you can't, you can't rock the desert by counting the grains of sand. You, you need to see the desert as a whole, not as this one little grain of sand counted this many times, and that's what makes up the desert, because it's not what makes up the desert. <laughs> the, the traits that honeybees have, I think, are complicated enough, and, and, and there's so many of them, and, and the combination of them creates such complex things that end up with results that we like or don't like, but I don't think we can really pick a trait and breed for it and never come out ahead on the deal. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I realize, um, in, in some ways, I, I, what, I'm, what I'm ending up telling you is, is to not be that picky. But, and that kind of is what I'm telling you, because here's, here's one of the reasons why you need to not be that picky. <coughs> it's funny to hear... A bee scientist stand up on one hand and talk about the genetic bottleneck we have and then talk about selectively breeding for borough sensitive hygiene because to me these two things are opposite. Um, I, I think most people don't understand selective breeding so let's talk about selective breeding a little bit. Back in the day when, when uh, chickens were just wild animals there was a lot of genetic potential for a lot of variety. You could end up with little chickens, big chickens, all different colored chickens, some of them lay, you know, green eggs, and some of them lay brown eggs, and some of them lay white eggs, and, and there was a lot of genetic potential for variety. Somebody decided they liked white eggs, so they bred chickens to just lay white eggs. Somebody liked just white chickens, so they bred chickens to just be white. Um, in our society, they went for white chickens with white eggs for these reasons. If you take a yellow-skinned white chicken and you pluck it, there's no little black feathers hiding in there. There's no little black noticeable pin feathers. There might be some white ones in there, but nobody will ever notice those. So they did that because it, the, uh, the consumer seemed to find it more appealing to not find those little black pin feathers in there. Um, never mind that it, it doesn't do anything for how they taste, it doesn't do anything for how nutritious they are, but it but it somehow keeps the consumer a little happier. And we go for white eggs so we can candle them so we can make sure there's not one little tiny bit of, of a spot of blood in there so that nobody will ever crack an egg and find a little spot of blood in an egg. It might remind them that it's actually, like, you know, just That's came out of the back end of the chicken. Um, <laughs> but we, we don't want to remind anybody that. We want them to think it just came from a factory and it's all perfect every time. So we do just the white eggs. So my point is, what you create is a genetic bottleneck in order to do that. You take this genetic potential for all these possibilities and you breed it down to where there's only one possibility. I can only get white chickens. I can only get yellow skinned chickens. I can only get white eggs. Um, so that is a genetic bottleneck. By definition, selective breeding is a genetic bottleneck. That is the, that is the concept of genetic breeding. A selective breeding. Now, does that mean selective breeding is all bad? It's not all bad, but it can be bad if you're not careful what you're doing. It's very, very quickly become bad. Um, if, if, you were, if you're just trying to breed out the stuff you don't want, and the stuff you don't want actually is meaningful, as opposed to yellow-skinned, um, white-feathered chickens that lay white eggs, none of which is meaningful, that's just chickens. Um, if you were breeding them to be healthy, you were breeding out the ones that weren't as hardy, if you were breeding out the ones that, that tend, you know, tend to get sick easily, if you were breeding out maybe the ones that are too small to do well in Nebraska in the winter because they don't lay eggs in the winter if they're really small and they're in Nebraska, maybe it might serve some purpose for me to breed 
a bigger, healthier chicken. Doesn't do me much good though to breed a chicken just to be white and lay white eggs and so on. Um, so I guess I'm saying you can do some selective breeding and, and improve your results for what it is that, is, that really is important. But what you gotta be careful of is that you're not doing this for things that aren't important. Because then you're, you're limiting the gene pool for no good reason and you're losing some of that vigor for no good reason. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Well, you can lose yeah. things that you don't even know you're losing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Not only that, sometimes you're fixing traits you don't realize you're fixing that are actually bad. And, and you don't find it out until later. This happened in, in, the, in the quarter horse world. They had uh, a particular stallion that was, I'm trying to think what he was in. I think he was in just the show of the, the halter class, you know? He was just really muscular, had these huge muscles. And they just thought he was the greatest thing, and they bred him with everybody who was trying to do that in the quarter horse world, bred to this stallion, and then they bred a lot of those offspring back to this stallion again, and all of a sudden, almost all the quarter horses in the, in the entire United States had a genetic defect from this stallion that nobody realized he had until it got bred back to there and it fixed that trait. And now they can't get rid of it. And now they're, they're stuck. They don't know what to do. Um, uh, basically, it's the, the trait is that, and it's probably why he was so muscular looking, it, it has to do with the muscles just getting all tensed up and they can't relax them. And then they, and, and it, so it's sort of like having tetanus, you know? So my point is, what he just said is, is right. You, you end up losing things you didn't know you lost, and then you end up fixing things you didn't want to fix. You know, and by fixing, I mean you, you, you make it so it won't go away. You, you make it so, it's, so it's always, they're always going to have that. <coughs> so I, that, that's my, that was my point on the bottom there, too, is you don't know what genetic traits they're going to need to survive the next bee crisis. What if the next bee crisis is the tropical alapse gets here? And now the bees need to be able to handle that. And whatever trait it is it might take them to handle that, we bred it out when we were trying to breed BSH. Because we fixed all of these traits of this one particular line of bees that had this OCD, and now we've lost that, that, that next thing we might need. Um, Randy Oliver tells the story of, of, of the potatoes. Um, there's a, there's a place in South America somewhere where all, this, all these potatoes come from, this one particular valley. There's thousands of varieties of potatoes that live in this valley. They were raising two of those in, in Ireland and most, most of Europe at the time of the Irish potato famine. And it turns out that these two are both susceptible to the blight that wiped out all the potatoes, which caused the potato famine. Well, of those thousands of potatoes in that valley, less than 1% of them are susceptible to this blight. If they would have had 20 different varieties of potatoes in Ireland, probably nobody would have starved. They would have just lost a few potatoes and they wouldn't have quite done as well that year as they did some years. But as it was, all of them were susceptible and they all died. And why was that? Because they had too narrow of a gene pool. Their gene pool was just these two varieties. And those two varieties both lacked the ability to handle that fungus and so all those people died. Because of the lack of genetic diversity, in, in potatoes. Well, we may find ourselves at the same point if we narrow the, the gene pool of the bees down to just the ones that are ESH, who knows what we've lost that we're going to need in the future when something else comes along. Because things do come along, whether it's a potato blight for the potatoes or whether it's the varroa mite for the bees, other things come along. It's just life, you know? Things, things happen and then things have to adapt. And if they don't have the genetic diversity to adapt, then we're in trouble. So I think we need to maintain the diversity. Um, um, this, this, is, this is that point that a lot of these things are, are, are some multiple combination of these things that, that causes them to work. You know, everybody decided that hygienic behavior was probably how bees were dealing with varroa mites who were dealing with them. And so they went to the Africanized bees who were doing just fine with varroa, and they started testing for hygienic behavior, and they didn't have any. So, um, kind of threw a wrench in that theory that that was how bees were dealing with it because here's the bees that are dealing with it and they don't have that trait that we're trying to breed for that we think is going to give them the ability to deal with it. Um, the fact is it's probably a complicated thing and it may, not, it may not be one trait, it may not be two traits, it may not be ten traits. It may be a combination of things that allows them to survive under certain conditions. Um, 
I, I would, well, maybe I'll get to it eventually here, but. Um, the, the fact is we are always assuming the success of a hive is the genetics of that colony. In reality, it may be the genetics of the microbes that are living in that colony. It, it may be that the whole reason that this hive is doing well and this hive is doing poorly is the microbes that are living in it. Um, and, and we don't know that. Uh, yeah, I, just just a, weird, a weird one to do with the microbes and to, and to do with these bees. These bees have this, uh, I've, I've never been able to pronounce it, is it uh, Teletiki? Is that, what, is that how you pronounce it? How would you pronounce that? Teletiki. So, um, Teletiki is the ability of a worker bee to lay an egg that then can, that's a fertilized egg. Basically, it's, it's a clone of the bee that laid it because it doesn't have any semen from a drone, but it's basically laying an egg that then can be developed into a queen or it can develop into a worker. That's, that's Teletiki. That yeah. She's, she's got the study back there. She's Xeroxed them off. You can pick one up okay. on your way out, or you can read it on bee source. Um, but they did some research on these bees, so this isn't just D saying this. Um, Eric Erickson and, and a couple of, you know, Eric, Eric and another bee scientist, I don't remember their name, and, and D and Ed did this research on, on that. Now, it, I, I bring this up because there's a wasp. <coughs> and they found two varieties of this wasp. One of the varieties <coughs> has the ability of, uh, of Boletiki, and the other one doesn't. But they're both the same, they're just two varieties of the same genus and species of wasp. And they thought there was something <coughs> different genetically in the wasps. And so they were studying them, trying to find what was genetically different about these two wasps. Well, it turns out that one of them, is a, one of them has a different bacteria living in it than the other one does, and the bacteria is what causes it to have this Boletiki. Um, my, my point of pointing that out is that the bacteria that live in here do much more complex things than we might ever imagine. We, we think that it's just the organism of the bee when actually a lot of what causes its success or failure or even some very strange behaviors like Thalitiki may be the bacteria that's living in the bee and not the genetics of the bee. So um, we may be trying to breed bees and we're looking for this one trait and the fact is the difference between the success and failure here had nothing to do with the genetics of the bee. Um, it had to do with the genetics of the bacteria living in the bee or the yeast that was living in the, in, in the bee bread. This, this is an illustration of how you can get misled. Um, uh, Jay Smith's story here basically is that he was, he was choosing queens to breed from and he had this one hive that was just a, just a boomer. It was making all kinds of honey. He thought it was just an awesome hive. He was gonna he was gonna raise queens from this hive. Um, so he finally gets around to looking at it. And he opens up the hive and it's all full of laying workers. It's queenless. He doesn't even know how long it's been queenless. But it happens to be at the end of the row, um, toward where the crop is, and at the end of the row toward the direction the wind blows. And so what was happening was all the bees were drifting to that end. <coughs> My point of this is. If you're, if you're picking this one queen and you think this one queen is just going to have all this awesome offspring because that colony happens to be doing well, you may be misled. The fact is, things are more complicated than that. It may be doing well just because it happens to be on the end of the line and it gets a lot of drift. It may be doing well because of the bacteria in their gut. It may be doing well because it just happened to have a good sense of timing for that year or maybe something caused it to have a good sense of timing for that year because something set it back and it just happened to hit the flow just right and everything just worked out good. Um, every year the bees are gambling. So they have to start raising bees early enough to have a maximum population when the flow hits in order to raise, in order to bring in a lot, of, a lot of nectar. And they need to bring in a lot of nectar or they won't have enough to get through the winter. So they have to start raising bees at a time when there's no nectar coming in. That's a gamble. How much are they going to raise? Well, if they're Italians, they'll raise a whole lot more than the Carniolans. But the fact is, it's a gamble. And the ones that gamble big are the ones that lose big, and they're also the ones that win big. If they raise a whole bunch of bees and the flow happens to hit just right when that, that population peaks, they might make a bumper crop. But if that flows two weeks late, they might all starve to death. And if that flows two weeks early, um, they'll probably still do better than the one that was kind of postponing things because, you know, 
They, they, they started early enough that that two weeks early didn't hurt them as badly as it did the ones that were still postponing things and didn't raise enough early enough. So my point is it may just depend on the luck of that year that this colony is a bumper crop awesome colony and next year they may suck. They may not do very well at all because the timing next year might not be what the timing was this year. Um, I, I, I know I almost sound like you're, I, you're wasting your time even trying to choose which bees you're going to bring down. But in a way, I kind of am, but we'll get to that. Can um, I just ask a brief question about, sure. the, about the drones? I and mean, it would seem to me that the queen is this one bee who has these particular traits. But if, <coughs> would it, if, wouldn't it be more like the success of the hive is more related to a wild-mated queen with a ton of genetic diversity? Oh, well, well, pretty much there's plenty of research to back exactly that up. But yes, the, the, more, the more drones she mates with and the more unrelated all those drones are, the more successful the colony is. That's, there's, there's a, several studies on polyandry and, and queens and how much that contributes to their success. So yes, and, and, but I am kind of getting some of those, although, I mean, if, I, if I'm raising a whole bunch of queens off of this one queen, this first queen might be from one drone, the next one might be from a different drone, the next one might be from a different drone, so I really can't guarantee what any given one of these is going to be, except that that combination seemed to work well in that colony, but, you know, I can't predict a lot more than that. Let's look at what we've done in the past. For the last 150 years, at least, maybe 200 years, people have been breeding bees to make no propolis, as little as possible. That's been the philosophy. If they make almost no propolis, that's a wonderful bee. Um, they, they, will, they bred for solid brood patterns. They, that means there's not a single hole in this, in this brood. It's just all solid brood. All capped, all beautiful. They bred for queens that would never shut down. It works really well if you're raising packages, if they just raise brood like crazy, because you can have a whole bunch of bees really early, and you can throw them in a package, or you can ship them off to the almonds, and they're all nice and build up really early. We bred them for color, because everybody wanted the yellowest bee they could get. So we bred Italians to be, they're not yellow like yellow jackets. I kind of wish everybody would stop using those yellow and black bees because it misleads the public who don't know what bees look like. But, but they bred for the more yellowish brown rather than a lighter brown rather than a more leather brown. Um, we, we, they bred for larger bees. They wanted bigger bees because they thought bigger bees could carry more, more uh, nectar. Um, they bred for less drones because drones are just wasting resources, right? They bred for less swarming. So what did we get? Here's what we got. We got bees who don't make enough propolis. And Marla Spivak did a whole bunch of research lately on how much healthier bees are. The more propolis they make, the healthier they are. And if you can incite them to make more propolis, you'll have healthier bees than if they make less propolis. And if you bred for more propolis, you'd get healthier bees than if you bred for no propolis. So we did that wrong for, for almost 200 years. We bred that wrong. The next thing was we bred for bees that, that would have perfect brood patterns? Well, we bred against hygienic behavior. For 200 years, we bred against hygienic behavior, and then we wondered why we don't have any hygienic behavior in our bees. Well, because we bred against it for 200 years because we thought it was a good thing to have a solid brood pattern. The fact is, instead of just looking at the big picture and saying, well, the colony's healthy, it's doing well, I don't care if there's a few empty cells in there. Who cares? If there's a lot of empty cells in there, then I probably have an inbred queen. It's kind of another topic, but basically, a, a, if a queen's bred too close to her, to her own drones, or too close to relatives of hers, sh she'll lay diploid drones. In other words, she fertilizes the egg, but the sex alleles match up in such a way that it, that, it, that it ends up being a drone. And then the bees don't tolerate diploid drones, they just remove them all. So if you have really spotty brood, it could be because it's an inbred queen, and that's what they were trying to avoid was the inbred queen. But what they accomplished was they basically bred all the hygienic behavior out of the bees. So, let's go to the, the drones. We bred them to have less drones, and we bred them to not swarm very much. So, what happens? The AHB comes along, the AHB make plenty of drones, and the AHB will swarm at the drop of a hat. So, we're all upset because they can out-reproduce our bees. The reason they can out-reproduce our bees is we bred our bees to be reproductively challenged. And after we bred them to be reproductively challenged, then we got upset when a bee came along that actually had not been bred to be reproductively challenged and took over. You shouldn't have been surprised. You created the situation. You bred them to be reproductively challenged and left this vacuum. So we bred for all the wrong things for 200 years is what I'm telling you. The only thing we were breeding for that was useful was two things, gentleness and productivity. And other than that, everything else we were breeding for was wrong. Okay? 
And, and we pretty much know that now. This isn't just my opinion. Pretty much, you know, Arlo Spivik's saying we need more propolis and we got less, and, and she's, also, she's also one of the big ones on the hygienic behavior. But, um, so what we should have been breeding for was overall health and vital vitality. We should have been breeding for the ability to have a seamless supersedure. We should have been breeding for bees that are well adapted to your climate so they build up at the right time, peak out at the right time, cut back at the right time so that they, so that they have a lot of bees to gather the, 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 the flow and they don't starve to death in the middle of a dearth. That's what we should have been breeding for. Nature's breeding for all these things on its own just because you know they build up too much at the wrong time, they just starve to death, right? We feed them. I understand that. I'm not against that because some years the bee, you can't blame the bees because some years it's not their it's not their fault that that year there happened to be a big drought. Um, but if you, especially if you get some feral bees, you'll probably get some that are already adapted to your climate and your flows. Typically, if you're picking them for productivity, what you're really doing is you're choosing them based on them building up at the right time for your flows because that's how they get productive. If they build up at the right time, they tend to make a lot of honey. If they build up at the wrong time, they don't make a lot of honey. So just by picking them to make a lot of honey, you're probably picking them to be adapted better to your, to your flows. But um, I, I'm all for productivity. I don't really want bees that aren't going to make me honey. <coughs> as as C.C. Miller said when he talks about queen rearing, he says overwintering takes care of itself. And that's basically true. If they can't overwinter, they're going to die. And if they die, then I've taken them out of the gene pool. And, and as I should, because I don't have any use for raising bees in Nebraska that can't live in Nebraska. Um, gentle and manageable to me is important, um, especially if you're going to have them in town, it becomes even more important, but I think it, it's pretty important anywhere. Um, I, to me, it's no fun dealing with really, really vicious bees, and if you've ever dealt with an F1 cross um, of, of like Buckfasts and, and uh, AHB or whatever, they're, they're, they're vicious. They're not, just, they're not just a little bit defensive, they're like you can't see out of your veil defensive. Like they're pouring out of the hive and you haven't even opened it up defensive. Um, so I'm all for gentle and manageable. Um, I, I think it's important that they're gentle and manageable. So how do you assess a, whether you're going to breed from a queen? <clears throat> well I want to clean this at least her and her bees have gone through a winter in my winter. And I, I don't just mean her, because if she was raised in the late fall, then I don't know that these are even her bees that are going through the winter. I want her bees to go through the winter. So if, I, if she got raised in the middle of summer, six weeks later, these are all her bees, right? So, you know, if she got raised in June, then July, August. By August, is pretty much all her bees. If they make it through the winter, then I know they can winter. I don't know that until then. I wouldn't mind if they could get through two winters, but one winter is enough that at least I know they can survive a winter. Um, I need them to have gone through at least one flow with that queen's workers in order to know if they're going to be productive. But pretty much I kind of need to go through a year with that, with that queen in order to see in the spring, if I get through the winter and then that whole next year, then I have a pretty good idea, did they build up at the right time, did they, did, did they drop off when there was a drought like they should have, did they, you know, what, how did the population go compared to what the climate did. Um, so. I probably need at least a full year before I even know whether I want to breed from this queen. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So how do you maintain genetic diversity? Um, the, first, the first trick is don't breed all your queens from the same line. Okay, so I've got this hive. I think it's really awesome. I want to raise some more queens from it. So I raise a batch of queens from this hive. Now I want to raise another batch of queens. I'm not going to raise it from this hive because I already raised one from this hive. I want to maintain more genetic lines than that. So I'm going to pick my next best hive, and I'm going to raise some from that one. And then after I do that, I'll probably pick another one and raise some from that one. Because if I just raise them all from one line, then I'm creating a bottleneck in the gene pool, and I don't want to create a bottleneck. <coughs> think, you need to think more in terms of removing what you don't want. In other words, if i got a hive that's really way too mean, then that might be what I want to requeen. Um, if I've got a hive that's just plain not producing at all, then maybe I want to requeen that one. If I've got hives, though, that are reasonably productive and they're healthy and they're, and they're doing all right, then I probably want to keep those lines. I don't want to replace them. I want to keep them around because I want to maintain that depth of the gene pool. And I can't maintain the depth of, of the gene pool if I just pick this one queen and raise all my queens from it. 
Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Yep. The other thing I do is I do a lot of walk away splits. I've got a whole bunch of hives out here I think are fine. I just, and especially in my out yards, I don't tend to raise a bunch of queens and put in them. I just do, a, I split them and let them raise their own queen. And every time I do that, it lets that line keep, keep maintaining. Now I've got two of that line, but that line has now reproduced and is still in my bee yard. It's still within my colonies and I've, made, I've maintained another genetic line. Uh, so the more of those genetic lines I can, I can continue while at the same time getting rid of the, the, the bees I really don't want, the ones that aren't productive at all, the ones that aren't healthy at all, the ones that, that are meaner than I want to deal with, um, all the other ones I'd like to maintain those lines. I'd like to keep them going. So I want to keep the, the gene pool, I, I want it to be good bees, but I also want a broad gene pool. I don't just want all of them from one line. Um, so probably by the time I'm breeding from a queen, she's two years old. Because the first year I was just trying to assess whether she's worth breeding from. The second year, now she's pr proven herself. She got through the winter, and they, they, they hit the flows pretty well. You know, I may have an idea if I want to breed from her. Um, if, if you're really only using the queen for queen breeding, and she's not like running a full-size colony anymore, she might last several years. I mean, she might last six or seven years. She certainly ought to last two or three. If you're if you're just not you're just keeping her in a limited amount of space to lay, and you're just grafting queens off of her, so she's not laying three thousand eggs a day. She's just laying a few hundred eggs a day. She might last quite a while. And if I want to breed a lot from her, especially if I want to sell them to other people, because I think she's a really exceptional queen, um, I'm probably going to keep her around for a while. I already kind of talked about the gambler, but just from the point of view of uh, choosing a colony, this concept's been around a while. Um, Miller didn't entirely agree with it, but most people can see the logic in it, I think. Um, if you breed from the outliers, in other words, you breed from the, the bee that made three times as much honey as all your other hives, you may just be breeding from the ones that gambled really big and they just got lucky this year. Um, they may gamble really big next year and just crash. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't do a walk away slip from it and keep the line going, but I'm not going to get too carried away and think, uh, oh wow, I got this queen that's going to raise all these queens that are all going to make 200 pounds of hive. Because <coughs> odds are they just did that because they got lucky, not because they were good. Um, so that theory is that basically you ought to, you ought to breed from the average bees and not the outliers. The outliers are, are probably just the ones that got lucky, not the ones that had the best genes. This is C.C. Miller's, um, he's, he's not against taking the outliers, but basically his point is, uh, his point is it's not all that complicated. Um, you know, if you, if you take the ones that are productive, and, and you take the ones that survive the winter, and you take the ones that are gentle enough that they're worth working, then you pretty much got what you want. You don't make it any more complicated than you have to. Um, this is him talking about the outliers, and, and 